really funny. I've seen her on TV many times. I was thrilled when she came right to my community to perform. I couldn't believe it. Everything comes from her heart. And in today's world, you don't meet many individuals like that. And I wish that people would learn how to follow in her footsteps because I think it would make today's world even that much better. So that's what's special about Kathy. Probably the most powerful and loving and caring angel. Hello, I'm Kathy Buckley, sometimes known as America's first hearing impaired comedian. And on my traveling, people keep asking me, do you have a tape? Well, here this. This is your tape. And I couldn't think of a better place to introduce it to you than the ocean, my favorite place. In this tape, you're going to see that I'm going to share my life story with you and how I found the humor in some of my tragedies. You'll find yourself laughing and crying and how I felt that society placed a lot of labels on me. You're too tall, you're too flat, you can't, you won't, you're retarded, you're deaf. And how I managed to take those labels off and find out that I can make a choice to find the positive into my life. And hoping that you too will see that you don't need to have any negativity placed upon you. So please, enjoy the tape and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kathy Buckley. Just don't listen. <laughs> Get a load of this. This is my brand new hearing aid. It's computerized now. I have the hearing aids in my ears, and this <laughs> is my remote control. <laughs> this baby cost me $4,000. You got anybody here from Texas? Yeah? Go home. I worked in Texas for three weeks, and I gotta tell you, you people have got the slowest moving lips I have ever read in my life. <laughs> Guy come up to me, he said, my name is B. -M. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> yeah. How the heck did you get five syllables out of four letters? Born, I was born RH negative, and then a couple years later, I developed spina meningitis. That's just told my family, quote, that I would be a slow learner and that I would not grow to be any taller than 5'2". <laughs> and I was in a school for retardation for two years before they found out it was just a hearing loss, and they called me slow. <laughs> in that school, my best friend was a little Asian girl. She was blind. I have no concept of blindness means because my eyes are my life. But every day we would have lunch together. She said these great barbecue beef sandwiches. And I'd have these boring peanut butter and jelly. So every day we would exchange lunch. Now what I didn't realize until I got older, she never saw me exchange those lunches. <laughs> but then again, I never heard her complain about it either. Now some people think that I me mean, hearing impairment is a handicap. Me, whenever I'm with the Italian side of my family, <laughs> we're talking a perfect gift here. <laughs> Can you imagine a hearing impaired child who's just learning how to read lips and to be with a bunch of Italians whose mouths are going 80 miles an hour? <laughs> and their hands. Heaven only knows what their hands are saying. I myself was just learning sign language. I figured, well, maybe they're signing with a lisp. <laughs> One of the first times that I did learn as a child was good morning. And I got to tell you, as a kid, I was so excited that I could communicate that the very next family reunion, I went up to everybody and I signed, good morning. <laughs> I 
I guess you can say they're not morning people. <laughs> now, lip reading is my main source of communication, and I do have to go up to people sometimes and say, excuse me, um, but I do lip read, and I usually get this. Ooh, um, so sorry. <laughs> Like I have a degree in dentistry and I'm looking in the cavities back here. <laughs> and I spent a good 13 years with some of the top speech therapists in this country just learning how to talk so people would understand me and now they all think I'm from New York. <laughs> I've not had a date in three and a half years. Now I don't know if it's because I haven't heard the phone ring or what. <laughs> I'd love to hear what my date says to me at night, but I can't hear in the dark. <laughs> so I wear a little miner's cap with a bright white light right here. <laughs> How many people here have gotten speeding tickets? <laughs> really? What are you in such a hurry for? <laughs> this is where deaf and dumb come in handy. One night, a police officer pulls me over, comes up, and he beams this flashlight right into my car window. I look at him, I said, Officer, I don't understand why you pull me over. I want that going fast. <laughs> the officer looked at me. <laughs> so, officer, I'm sorry, but I cannot lip read you in the dark. So I grabbed his flashlight and I beamed it on him. <laughs> I own five of them right now. Remember playing kids' games? Yeah. Remember hide and seek? Yeah. I hated that game. <laughs> By the time I would hear somebody say, Kathy, will you come and get us? I'd be sitting at 3,001. <laughs> 3,002. It's okay. My little blind friend, she never did find me. <laughs> How about musical chairs? Remember that game? Yeah, there's a game for a deaf kid. <laughs> I was probably the only five year old kid that got whiplash from watching Stupid Needle on the record player. the tail on the donkey? You do not blindfold a deaf child and then set them loose. <laughs> I felt like Helen Keller. Where's this donkey behind? <laughs> I travel all the time. I do a lot of work on behalf of the government for the ADA law. Do you know what the ADA law is? This is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is a law to enforce that all people with disabilities will have equal rights opportunity in education, transportation, recreation, and employment. Now, I truly believe if you wish to make an establishment accessible for someone with a disability, ask someone with that disability what is needed. Otherwise, you're wasting time and money, correct? Cool. Because I am in Iowa driving a car, and I get hungry. Now, you have to visualize this. I'm in a car driving. I get hungry. I go to a drive through restaurant. I roll down the window, what's outside? The menu, right? It is in braille for the blinds. <laughs> Think about it, folks. <laughs> Pretty much explains those little bumps on the highway for you, don't you think? <laughs> I was so surprised, I yelled into the speaker, I said, I'm deaf, I can't hear, and I cannot read Braille. So when I come up to the window, just throw food into the car, okay? <laughs> I went to St. Louis for a graduation for independent living. This is for people with disabilities who've gotten their own job and their apartment. At this graduation, they had a gag gift party. They gave a blind man a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> He was in the corner all night long going, is that it? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and because I was the host, they gave me name that tune. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> then there was Michael. Now Michael, I couldn't figure out why he was there. I work with people with disabilities all over the country, and I'm really, really good at picking up the conditions when I see it. I couldn't figure out why Michael was at this graduation. Apparently, he was an amputee. He had artificial limbs on. I did not know this. They gave him the game Twister. <laughs> I offered to play the game with him. He lays it out. He spins it. Right foot on blue. all 
all the time. And you know how they have at the airport the security check? I went through it in Cleveland Hopkins Airport. I went to step through it, and the security guard recognized me from television. He's like, oh my God, you're the deaf comedian. May I please have your autograph? I'm like, yeah, sure, get me a piece of paper and pencil. Well, he left to get the paper and pencil. I'm standing at the security check. People are coming through. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to take over for him. <laughs> I can't hear. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, did you beep? <laughs> no? Okay, well take your Uzi and have a nice flight. I was on the airplane. I was going, I think I was going from North Carolina back to LA. And I was on the airplane. And you know how they have the exit row in the plane? Now, is that not the leg room spot? Do you know it's against the law for anyone with a disability to sit in that row? I am six foot tall. I didn't plan on being deaf and six foot tall, okay? But I need the leg room. So I sat in the exit row. They're not going to know. You can't tell by looking at me, right? Cool. Apparently the flight attendant's talking to me. I don't hear her. <laughs> so she taps me on the shoulder and says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. I didn't hear you. She says, Oh, well, you can't sit here. I said, Well, why not? She says, Well, if something should happen, you wouldn't understand what the captain's saying. I said, Nobody understands what the captain's <laughs> saying. She said, well, if something should happen, you wouldn't know when to open the door. I said, I can smell fire. <laughs> and if I'm sitting here reading my magazine and I looked up and all 250 passengers are charging at me, <laughs> I know to open the door. <laughs> the one thing I really don't like about traveling, all across the United States in the bathroom, they have what they call these self-flushing toilets. Have you seen them? You don't get up quick enough, you got yourself a bidet, huh? <laughs> but the one thing I love about traveling, God, he has the most wonderful way of putting some of the most incredible people in my path. I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Anybody ever been there? Don't go back. Remember that. I'm still amazed at the racism that goes on in this country. But I was at the hotel called the Choo Choo, and the hotel clerk hits the bell for my bellhop to come and get my bag. My bellhop is a skinny, little, black man, 71 years old, coming up to the deck. <laughs> got his pants hiked up to here, got this 23 inch zipper thing going on here. Ma'am, my name is John, and my job is to get your bag too. <laughs> John, honey, my bags are bigger than you. I go, no, that's okay, John. I can take my own bags, no problem. He says, no, ma'am, it's my job. Get your bags, too. I said, John, sweetheart, by the time you get my bags to my room, my plane will be taken off again. <laughs> no, ma'am, I get them there by Thursday. <laughs> now, I didn't feel right about letting this gentleman take my bag. But then again, who am I to take a job away from him? Probably the very thing that keeps him going, right? right. Yeah, but I still didn't feel right about it. So I told him, I said, you know what, John? I can take your ba my own bag. I got wheels on them. He said, no, ma'am, it's my job. I know, it's your job to take my bags from my room. <laughs> so I grabbed my bags with one hand, stuck John under my armpit, and walked out the lobby. <laughs> I fell in love with John. He was this beautiful old soul. And every time I went down to the lobby, I see John. Hi, John. How you doing, John? I'm grabbing him. I'm hugging him. I'm kissing him all over the face. And he's going, get this white woman off of me. <laughs> he goes, what about you, ma'am? I go, what do you mean, me? He goes, being deaf and all. I go, does it hurt? Yeah, John. Sometimes, honey. He goes, ma'am, you can't be kissing on me like that down here. People going to be talking at you. Well, that's okay, John. I'm deaf. I ain't gonna hear a darn thing they say. <laughs> All anybody ever wants is to be treated with respect. But in order to be treated with respect, you have to be able to give it. But in order to give it, you have to have it for yourself first and foremost. And then you have the wonderful gift to give it away. Life is good!
Yeah. You guys want to hear some good news? Yeah. Good news is they did come out with hearing aids for my particular hearing loss, and I have been hearing new sounds now for the last 12 years. I have thanked God and every Japanese man that crosses my path. <laughs> this is the very first hearing aid in the whole world where the computer chips are actually inside the hearing aid. Where do you think they made it? Japan? United States of America. The computer chips were designed by AT&T. Now they're charging me for every word I hear. <laughs> sounds are incredible to me, but one of the first sounds that I did hear were the birds. And I tell you, I cried like a baby. I was walking down that street and I heard that little bird and I looked up into the tree and I just said, Birds are difficult to live with. They've got these tiny little bits. <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to go camping all the time and everybody would be complaining, Who can sleep with all these darn crickets? <laughs> But when I heard my first cricket, I went looking all over for it so I could lip read its little mouth, you know? <laughs> and when I finally found it, I got the tail end of it. Go ahead, lady, lip read this. <laughs> I had a difficult time locating where sounds were coming from. You become a kid all over again. Hearing sounds, it's like you become this little child and you just want to go out and explore the world. And I truly believe that each, each and one of us kept that little boy or little girl alive inside of us. We we'll always have a smile on our face. Always. Isn't that true we all pass judgment? The nine times out of ten when we pass a judgment, it's a negative concept, correct? Well, I pass a judgment. I'm a very lovely lady. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to perform at the Kennedy Center for some kind of award presentation. I really didn't have any idea what it was all about. When I got there, the stage manager of the show asked me to go into the green room. He said, I need to be quiet in this room because the noise from this room can travel onto the stage. Now, I myself have never seen noise travel. <laughs> they say this stuff happens, I go along with it. I go into the green room, and in the green room is a woman. She's in a wheelchair. She's a quadriplegic. My first judgment I passed upon was, my God, what kind of a life is this? She can't move. She can't walk. She can't talk. She has nothing to contribute to society. In five seconds or less, I had this woman pegged for death, me. But me being who I am, I went up to her and I said, hi, how are you? She started to open her eyes. At first, I was taken back. I was like, <laughs> hi, how are you? And her eyes started to open up really wide. When her eyes got really wide, her assistant came by and she said, when she opens her eyes, it means yes. When she closes her eyes, it means no. I said, great, I spent my whole life learning how to read lips, and I got to go to school for some eyelids over here. <laughs> the woman in the wheelchair started to laugh. It was a horrendous sound. It was this, eh, eh, eh. But to me, it was the most beautiful sound I ever heard. I realized right then and there, I can communicate with her. So here you have me and Ruth in the middle of this green room, and all you can hear is this, eh, 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 eh. You go, come on, Ruth, let's get some dancing shoes on. Let's get out of here. She says, eh, 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 eh. Stage manager screaming, get the death squad away from the quad. <laughs> that night, Ruth won an award. She wrote two top-selling books with the blink of an eye. With today's technology, she too had the computer. It's called a wood board. They hook it up to the wheelchair. The wire goes up to her eyelid. She sees the letters she wants. She blinks her eyes. That slow for each letter. And it goes into the computer. Two top-selling books. I haven't even read a book yet. <laughs> I graduated from high school with a one-point average. Nobody bothered to tell me we were collecting points. <laughs> That night after the show, Ruth had a computer printout for me, and it said on it, thank you so much for making me laugh, but more than anything else, thank you for treating me like you would have treated anyone else. I took that piece of paper and I wrote on the back of it, and I handed it to her.
I said, there, that's my bill. <laughs> Around the corner comes a gentleman in a wheelchair. He has cerebral palsy. He has no front teeth. Me being who I am, where the heck are your teeth? Man starts to laugh. <laughs> it's her husband. <laughs> She's married. I couldn't believe it. I looked her square in the eye and I said, you know what, Ruth? I came in here tonight and I thought to myself, my God, what kind of a life is this? Because I didn't think I could do it. Here you wrote two top selling books. I don't like to read. You're married. I can't even get a date. <laughs> I said, I hope you get pink eye. <laughs> the moral of the story is, please, don't pass judgment upon anyone. You wouldn't want pass upon yourself. Because believe me when I tell you, there are no limits as to what you can possibly do with your life. When I heard Kathy Buckley's life story, I was strongly reminded that we often don't have full control of our life experiences and conditions and circumstances and but we do have control of our attitude and how we respond to those conditions and that's what I respect and admire about her that she's turned the negative into a positive she says that you have a choice and you can make your life what you want to make it so I mean I just think she's inspiring she's great for young people and old people and people like me my daughter and she's wonderful absolutely wonderful everything you hear in my act is based on truth all of it I was in a school for retardation for several years now a lot of people say oh my god that's terrible I said no in that school, there were no judgments passed. In that school, it wasn't what you couldn't do, but what you could do. And in that school, it wasn't the value of words and communication, but what your heart had to say. It was an incredible place to start a learning foundation for me. Passing no judgment from the time I was little. My best friend was blind. To this day, I don't know how we communicated. All I remember is that when we got together, we hugged. Ah, oh, it felt safe. It felt wonderful. And when I used to sit in front of her and show her everything I just learned that day, like she can really see what I'm saying. <laughs> but she must have thought she was sitting in front of a fan or something because you can see her hair going off into the breeze. <laughs> she was awesome. I used to copy all the other kids because I didn't understand what was wrong. I loved them all. Even the little boy without his arms. He had these great freckles and everything. I used to count them. I didn't know how to count at the time, I was just poking this poor kid in the face. <laughs> so one day they didn't kick me out of that school. <laughs> but it was a good school. But they found out I had a hearing loss. They took me out of that school and they put me in a school with the most incredible teacher in the world. And I pray to the high heaven that every child on this earth encounters a teacher like my Miss Joan Daly. Miss Joan Daly taught me how to talk. No, we haven't found a teacher to teach me how to shut up. <laughs> Miss Joan Daly taught me how to talk through a balloon. I was in a class with just one other student named Michael. We both had the same kind of hearing loss. I was with her for five hours a day, and she taught me how to talk through a balloon. She'd take a balloon, blow it up, tie it in a knot, and place it right here in her throat and chest. And I'd put my hand on the balloon, I could feel the vibration of her voice. She would say, say apple. Ah. Look, Kathy, come on, feel the vibration, sweetheart. Apple. Alba. Come on, Kathy, concentrate. You can do it, honey. Apple. Bye bye. I'm a lawyer. Your apple is short. Because your apple is wrong and my apple is right. <laughs> I like apples. Let's do bananas. <laughs> then we would fight. Sometimes we work on one word for two weeks until I could feel the vibration and articulate it, just like her. I often wondered if she was from New York. <laughs> I used to be in a class with Michael. She used to tell Michael and I, whoever did the very best at the end of the week, I'm going to take you out for hamburgers and french fries. Well, you better believe Michael and I, we were busting lips. 
And do you know, every Friday, both Michael and I were in the hamburger joint with Mick Joan Daly looking at each other going, I did better than you. I did better. Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> she didn't want one to be better than the other. She only wanted us to give the best that we had to give. She was incredible. She was the only person I really could communicate with for the two years I had her in my life. My family were in total denial of my hearing loss. Not because they were bad, just because they weren't educated. They didn't know what to do. But Miss Joan Daly, she never even explained to me about my hearing loss. She just sat and told personal stories about herself. And she had to say them, and then we had to repeat what she was saying to see if we understood everything she said. Let's just say I'm not qualified for gossiping. <laughs> I came up with a different story every time. I said that, apparently. <laughs> she was awesome. I loved her. I hated to go away on the weekend. I hated the holidays. I just wanted to be with her. She was so incredible. When I was 18 years old, I went back to look for Miss Joan Daly. I wanted to thank her for everything she did for me. When I got back there, I heard she died in a car accident. I never got to say thank you, but I know she's with me, because every time I swear, I get this little slap upside my head. <laughs> I don't know why she do it, they're the only words I can enunciate without my speech impediment. <laughs> but I love her and I know she's with me. Then they found out today that I had started giving me hearing aids and I started learning how to talk, so as far as they were concerned, I was sick. They sent me back to public school. I was in public school in fourth, fifth grade. I had no business being in a public school. I stole money. I stole candy. I stole things from my house to take to school to give to the other kids because I wanted them to like me. I just wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel a part of something. I didn't feel a part of my family because we weren't communicating. They were never telling me about my hearing aids. I had to wear these hearing aids with wire packs from here going up to my ears. I felt funny. I didn't know nobody else had to wear them. So I'm in school and I'm saying, hi, you like me to be my friend? I just want to be accepted. I want to be a part of something. Everybody wants to be accepted, a part of something. So I stole and I would give stuff away. I had no business being in a public school. I couldn't understand anything in the classroom. Teachers would have their back up against the blackboard. I couldn't hear what they were saying. By the time one kid would say something, I go to look for their lips, another kid's lips were moving. I was totally lost. I graduated from high school with a one-point average. I didn't even know we were collecting points. I swear to God, I went to college. I wanted to be a fashion designer, and they wouldn't let me into school because they said that my high school was only a one-point average. I go, can we change up one to a four? <laughs> but I did. So by the time I was 20 years old, I tried committing suicide five different times. Now, there are going to be some things I'm not going to be successful at. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't thank God for letting me fail at least five different times. <laughs> I was so lost and so confused for so long. When I was 20 years old, I was laying on a beach sunbathing. Lifeguard Jeep ran me over. Talk about not knowing what your job description is. <laughs> the Jeep ran over my face, stomach, chest, side, and back. I was laid up for five years. I died at the scene of the accident. I saw a life after death. At least I believe I did. It was like something told me it was going to happen before it actually happened. I was laying on the beach sunbathing. And I just felt this feeling that I was supposed to go, that I'm watching the Jeep, and I'm thinking to myself, my God, the way that Jeep is running around, someone's liable to get run over. <laughs> I never thought it was going to be me. It ran over my face, stomach, chest, side, and back. When it happened to me, when the Jeep ran over my face, I opened my eyes, and I saw the bottom of the Jeep. And I could see the two rear wheels coming at me. And all I could think about is I need to protect my head. So I went to put my hand up above my head, and unfortunately when I did that, the rear wheels took my elbows and took me and turned me. 
the next thing I remembered was this little old man just walking down the beach. He had this long white robe, long gray beard, hair, and he comes up and he sits on my stomach. And he goes, Catherine, this isn't going to hurt. You're going to hear a loud pop. My first thought was, doesn't he know I can't hear? <laughs> and he took his hand and he powered over my nose and he pulled it and it popped because it's broken. And he got up and he says, honey, everything's going to be all right. And when he got up, everything turned the most beautiful blue, a blue I yet to see on this earth. I was totally surrounded by it. And then the brightest, whitest cloud came toward me. And out of the cloud came the most beautiful hand. I thought it was my cousin Mary Lou who had passed away. But then the hand started to turn real slowly. And it started to change into the most beautiful hand I've ever seen. And all I could remember was, no, I'm not ready yet. And all of a sudden, the hand just reached out in this bright light. And I just sat there, like, I'm not ready yet. And when I said that, everything faded away. And I saw the paramedics started working on me. Laid up for five years. In and out of a wheelchair for two and a half years. They said I'd never walk again. I figured I didn't hear him. I got up and I left. <laughs> you see, I spent the first 20 years of my life looking for three things. Love, warmth, and acceptance. When I died, I got a love that is beyond this world. A warmth and knowing that I am totally protected and accepting, totally unconditional as I am. And then I was given a fourth gift, a gift I didn't even know was this. A gift of choice. Something loved me so much that it gave me the choice as to whether I wanted to stay or go. Now you have to remember, I just got run over by a jeep. I'm not thinking very clearly and somehow I ended up here. <laughs> I never forget the day I got up out of intensive care and they had me in a wheelchair by the window and I yelled at God. You can't do this to me. I can't be in a wheelchair. I can't have a hearing loss and be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Lord, please, just not do this. And I said, you know, when I thought about coming back, you didn't tell me about this. <laughs> but see, I didn't have a paralysis. I had what they call metathematic paralysis. This is when the pain is so severe, you can actually shut that part of your body off. And that's what I did to protect myself. I worked really hard to walk. I used to join the YMCA and I'd swim. Something told me that if I kept swimming, eventually my legs would follow with me. Either that or drag behind, I don't know, one or the other. <laughs> and with the love of the Lord, I just started, you know, I started working on it and I was walking and I was doing really good. I mean, the skinny legs are wobbly, but baby, I can dance. <laughs> you know? And so, I was like, I didn't know what to do with my life. When I started walking, one day I just packed my car up I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, and I started driving. I ended up at the Pacific Ocean, I looked at the ocean, I looked at the car, and I said, Don, I ain't going any further, am I? <laughs> I ended up in California. When I was 27 years old, I got diagnosed with cervical cancer. Now, after a while, you get a little upset. <laughs> so I sit in there, the doctor said, we'll have the surgery. I went in, I had the surgery. Six months later, I get a phone call, Kathy, we didn't get it all. I didn't know what to do. I was in my apartment, pacing the floor. Do I have the surgery? Do I not? I mean, I spent the first 20 years of my life trying to commit suicide. I finally died, and then I decided to stay. <laughs> and now you're telling me if I don't have the surgery, I have six months to a year to live. I have no family support. What do I do? There's a mirror on my wall. I swear to God, it was like a hand came out of the glass, took me by the back of the head, pressed my face in front of the glass and said, what's your name? Catherine. What's your favorite color? Pink. Pink if Mary likes pink. No, no. 
Blue. It's your life blue. What's your favorite food? I don't know. I eat anything anybody else is eating. I'm looking in the glass. I don't have a clue as to who the heck I am. I, a perfect child of God, and society took me by the back of the neck and said, here, you're going to be retired. Whoa, this is okay. I like this. I like this crew. These people are really great. No, 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 no. Now you're going to be deaf and you're going to learn how to talk. Wow, I love Miss Joan Daly. I want to be just like her. I'm going to be just like Miss Joan Daly. No, 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 no. Now you have your hearing aid. You're fixed. You're going back to public school. I don't understand the teacher. The teacher has her back turned to me. The kids are making fun of me. No, 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 no. Now you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life because you got run over by a jeep. God, please don't forsake me like this. I can't live like this. No, 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 no. Now I'm going to give you cancer. I'm going to give you six months so you don't live. This is where I learned how to say, no, 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 no. Hear this. How dare you say I cannot talk? How dare you say I cannot walk? How dare you say I cannot have a life? How dare me for listening to you? My whole life was wearing other people's labels. Society put labels on me. You're too tall. You're too flat. You're retarded. You're dumb. You can't. You won't. You're unlovable. Just loaded with labels all over me. Passing judgment on me. And I bought it. I believe this is who I am. Society created me to believe that I'm retarded. That I'm stupid. That I can't and I won't. I'm going to tell you something. I don't look very good in labels. <laughs> I remember that incredible gift choice. I remember that gift. And I remember thinking, I can change this. All those words that they put on me have been my enemy. They've been my enemy. They've stopped me from succeeding, from having self-confidence, from having a growth of any kind. I realized that I can now make my words my best friend. Because I'm choosing the words and the light in how God created me. I'm not too tall. Yeah, I'm still flat. <laughs> I'm not retarded. I'm intelligent. I'm a survivor. I'm beautiful. I love myself. If I'm going to wear any labels, they're going to fit. <laughs> and I'm going to design them for me. So now I realize this. I never went back for the second operation. I decided to take control of my life, take charge of it. I changed my diet. I changed my attitude. And I've been clean of cancer for over 15 years. I had a one-woman show in Hollywood. Every Thursday night at the theater, I would comp all the halfway house kids in the community to the theater. And after the show was over with, and it was so funny because my brother, Mark, would come backstage and go, Kathy, you can't go out there. There's all these kids out there with the attitudes and they're scaring the other people. And I said, Mark, I think I invited them. <laughs> and he said, well, I go, Mark, I think it'll be okay. Yeah, okay, you know. And after the show is over with, I stay after the rest of the people leave and I talk with the kids. And this one particular night was so incredible. We had about 23 kids and this one kid was sitting over here. All tattoo, earrings, no hair, you know, attitude by himself. Well, of course, that's the one I'm going to pick on. <laughs> said, all these tattoos. So I looked at him and said, don't they have any paper in your halfway house? <laughs> he goes, why, what do you mean? I go, well, you're drawing all over yourself. <laughs> I said, you have more jewelry on your head than I have in my jewelry box at home. He goes, yeah, well, I'm just making a statement. I'm being an individual. I'm being my own person. And I go, you are, are you? I said, come on up here. So he came up, and I put my hand on his shoulders, and I stood behind him. I said, I'm not going to hurt you. Just listen. I said, now, how many of you in this room right now own a pair of black jean pants that are 40 times bigger than your physique? <laughs> All of them raise their hand. Go, how many of you own a big black t-shirt, extra, extra, extra large? Everybody raises their hand. Go, how many of you, I'm naming everything he has on, 
go, how many of you have a tattoo? Three quarters of them raise their hand. How'd you get the money for that? <laughs> Three quarters of them raise their hand. I go, how many of you in this room have more than two holes pierced on your body and I don't want to know where? <laughs> Almost all of them raised their hand. And I held them really close to me and I said, you see, sweetheart, you're not an individual. You're not making a statement. You're looking for a place to fit. You just want to belong. If you really want to be an individual and you want to make a statement, wear your heart on your sleeve and let people see who God really created. Because I really believe that in each and every one of us, there is the most incredible package that only we can share with the world. No one else can share it. And you have to be able to be willing to open that package and give it out. I held on to him and he's crying and I looked up and saw all the other kids. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I didn't bring tissue. <laughs> I held him and I said, and he turned around and he just held on me and he's crying. And I said, you guys aren't alone. You think you're alone because you're choosing to be alone because you don't know how to communicate. Nobody's teaching you to communicate. We need to learn to communicate with our kids. We need to learn to listen to them. It's not always, you do this, you do this, you do that. It's like choices. I do it with my godchild. Julia, honey, you want orange juice or apple juice? She says apple juice, but we don't have any. Have the orange juice. <laughs> But she still got to make a choice. <laughs> Just because you choose to have something doesn't mean you're always going to have it. Because you know for a fact that what you want and what you need are two different things. And the problem with that is that every time we go for what we want, we miss the opportunity of what we need. God will always put in your path what you need. But you will always wander off for something that's not necessary. So you lose. Do you ever notice when you plan things? They would go, okay, now tomorrow I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. You one of those? You do that? You do that? You planned all day long, right? Well, tomorrow I'm going to do this. What do you do the next day? You plan for the following day, right? You want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Because <laughs> you ever notice? Half of your planning doesn't go through. You miss an incredible opportunity right here and now. It could be with your child, it could be with yourself, it could be with anything. But you're missing right here if your mind is all the way over here. Get in the moment. See what's really there for you. You'd be pleasantly surprised. I was 34 years old. You guys are going to figure out, how old is she now? <laughs> Women over there with calculators. <laughs> I was 34 years old when I went and got my hearing tested again. Now you have to remember, in fifth grade I had my hearing aids taken away from me and I never wore them again. Now I'm 34 years old and I'm having hearing aid tested again for the first time in years. I did not want to do it. It was the scariest time. All I did was cry through the whole thing. The doctor kept going, are you okay? Just take the test. I hear it. I hated it. As soon as the test was over with, I ran out of the room. Michael, the technician, pulled me back into the office and he laid out my audiogram. For the first time in my life, somebody, anybody, proceeded to explain to me about my hearing loss. He says, here, honey, see, this is why you can't hear on the phone because you're... I'm not retarded. No, Kathy, this is why you don't understand music like most people... Michael? Listen to me. Are you sure I'm not stupid? No, honey. This, this is why you have a hard time lip-eating people, because you're lip-eating people. Kathy, you're an incredible lip-eater. Honey, you just don't hear normally. I don't hear normally? No, honey, you're perfectly fine. You just don't hear normally. We'll get your hearing aids and you'll be fine. Yeah, right. I didn't want to wear them. They brought me back terrible memory. I came back a week later, I got those hearing aids on, and I walked out, and the first sound I heard was the traffic. This is really annoying. <laughs> Michael gave me a gift, and it wasn't the gift of sound. He gave me the gift of an identity. I can now answer a question that people have been asking me my whole life. What can't you hear? 
I don't know. If I can't hear it, how would I know? <laughs> I can't hear the birds. I can't hear children laughing. I can't hear water running. I can't hear leaves ruffling the ocean. But now, oh, my godchild, she's awesome. I love her laughter. It does something to my blood. It just makes, you, you know, laughter. The leaves rustling. The ocean is so incredible. It's like God saying, Psh, come here. I love it. It's awesome. All the sounds are great, but being having an understanding of who I am is even better. Hi, I'm Kathy Buckley. I happen to have a hearing loss. I'm not retarded. <laughs> All of that is so great. I took that hearing aid and I went out and I wore them. And I didn't think I was going to because I thought I was going to hate them. The first night I wanted to see if I could hear my dream. I did. I wore them to bed and I'm laying there. And you can't move your head because they squeal. They do a feedback thing. So I'm laying there. <laughs> and I realized that I always listen with my eyes, so I kept one eye open to see if I had to lip read anything. <laughs> you do, you become a kid all over again, I swear. That was something I was supposed to do when I was two years old. I got to do it at 34, you know? It's just really cool. But the really great thing about it, see, my whole life, I always wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to help make people feel better about themselves. But I couldn't, you know, because they were afraid with my hearing impairment that if a patient asked for a bedpan, I'd give them pork at ends. <laughs> I'd be a popular nurse. <laughs> so I ended up in comedy. There's a life, huh? I started on a dare from a comedy contest to help raise money for children to serve a palsy. I love children. I love them. And I want every child to have an opportunity. So my friend dared me to do this comedy contest. Now, I know nothing about comedy. I had two weeks to come up with material. Two weeks. I know nothing. I went to the comedy club. I couldn't lip read anybody. They had the mics in front of their mouth. So I didn't understand what they were saying. So I went home and I rented all these videos. You know? And none of them were closed caption. So I didn't understand what they were saying. But Robin Williams has the fastest lips I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and Whoopi Goldberg's lips barely move. So I'm sitting in front of the, the TV, crying, going, how am I going to do something that's totally impossible for me? I'm just crying for an hour. And then I thought, you know what? It's for the kid. So if I make a fool out of myself, it's not going to be the first time, and it ain't going to be the last. So I did it. I started talking about myself. I had to come up with three minutes of material. Three minutes of the unknown. The big night arrives. I'm scared to death. Do I go up there? How am I going to? I was so worried I wouldn't hear them call my name. Hello? Did they call me yet? Did they call me yet? They finally called me. I swear to you. And all my fears were gone. And I was standing in front of 250 people sharing my joke. I couldn't hear the laughter. But I'd play off the faces that I could see. And if I saw a face I didn't like, I'd just move on to another face. <laughs> I won that night. I won! the most incredible rush of my life. It was so incredible. What I didn't know is that if you won that contest, you had to go to the semifinals. <laughs> that meant more jokes. I ended up placing fourth out of 80 comedians who've been in the business from three to 10 years, and I was only in it for the two weeks. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. Life is good. I have to tell you, and I truly believe, that there's no future until you make peace with your past. And me and him did. We worked it out. And I got to tell you, forgiveness is probably one of the most awesome things to be able to do. Because in forgiving, you're teaching yourself self-respect, self-love. I didn't know those things could come out of, I was so concerned with, that person feeling okay. In the long run, I feel good. So life is about two things in my book. The gift of choice. It's a gift that's given to you that nobody can take away from you. You have unlimited choices. If you make the wrong choice, you can try to correct it with another choice to make it right. And forgiveness, 
it's party time. <laughs> you know, really, you get to forgive and you get on with life. So here's this. Your life is the most precious gift you'll ever have. And it's the only one you have. You'll come into this world alone, you will leave alone. Who you meet in between is the challenge of how you deal with your life. Remember, no matter how bad something is in your life, it has a time limit. And women, we know we can drag something bad on forever. <laughs> but also remember, no matter how good something's going on in your life, that too has a time limit. So stay in the moment and enjoy. Your choice, your life, so enjoy it to the max. God bless you. Great. You know, people ask me all the time, so how do you get along with your family now? Really good. But I had to work at it. You see, I placed a label on my parents. I expected them to be the so-called super being, and it was easy to blame them for things when things weren't going right. As I got older, I got to learn to see that they're just people, and when I saw them as just for who they are, I got to appreciate them more. So whenever I got really upset, I would sit and I would write in the sand all the things that would bother me. And then I would sit there and let the water come and take it away. It's kind of like let it go and let God kind of thing, but it works for me. I realized that in order for me to have a happy future, I needed to let go of all negativity. And to do that, you have to do forgiveness. And I realized I got to make choices in my life as to what can come and go. So life is great. It's all about what I make it. And I truly believe that each and every one of us were given an incredible, beautiful little package inside of us that only we can share with the universe. We're the only one with that gift. Some of us never get to share it because we spend so much time living up to the expectations of what other people want us to be or who we think we have to be or looking for a place to fit. Believe me when I tell you, in that package is your gift to share with the universe. So have the opportunity to open it and find out who you really are. Enjoy life to the max. It's a gift that was given only to us, so enjoy it. And God bless.